Hi, my name is Jim and today's topic is AM detection and our two principal metrics in receiving an amplitude modulated signal or for that matter any signal, be it TV or FM or whatever has to do with the sensitivity of the receiver which means its ability to amplify weak signals up to the point where it becomes useful to us and the selectivity which means it can discriminate from the other stations nearby so you only hear the one that you want to hear. So uh, to start off here we're going to have to go back into the late teens and early twenties and the circuitry of the day was called tuned radio frequency TRF and once we understand this we'll move into contemporary uh, receivers and then a little bit into the future with um, uh, digitally decoded uh, signals. Anyway so back in the day what they had is three or so gain stages I'm only showing two with three tuned circuits and these were tuned to the station of interest and there were three knobs on a radio so <clears throat> people had to go up and individually tune each one of these until they got the best signal they could get and this wasn't labeled in frequency um, kilohertz or wavelength period there were numbers 0 to 100 and then when you found out where your favorite station was is you wrote down the numbers for that station so you could go back to it. In a later time um, they ganged these which means that it was under control of one knob. Now the problem with that <clears throat> is that these have to track. For example if I'm tuning in 850 kilohertz all three of these have to be real close to 850 to gain the full functionality of the receiver. So uh, then once we amplify the radio frequency AM signal up, and this is just a standard AM envelope like uh, we saw before, and uh, we detect it with a very simple circuit here, or so it seems simple. It's a diode detector, and uh, we'll talk about this later. Basically and I'm using really really simple terms here cuts the top off of the waveform so you have the uh, crest of the waveform and the, uh, and the trough of it representing the modulation this serves to filter out the IF and we need a load on this so <clears throat> we're going to call that the volume control so that's actually built into the uh, detector circuit in this uh, all of the inductors have the same value and uh, all the capacitors are variable and they have the same value and that's not going to be the case uh, coming up. The tuning range on uh, this radio as designated by the FCC back in the 20s was from 530 kilohertz to about 1610 kilohertz. So um, all is well until we kind of look at the quality factor and what we would like to have happen is that the bandwidth remains the same if we turn tune the lower end of the band and we tune the upper end of the band. Now if the bandwidth is too wide the selectivity suffers meaning that adjacent channels can interfere and if the selectivity is too narrow that means that the upper frequencies of the signal are attenuated and uh, that is 5 kilohertz is the highest in AM that you can uh, you can transmit. So to further complicate our life here <coughs> the resistance of the windings is a function of frequency and it's actually a dynamic resistance and uh, part of the problem with that is, is if we look at a wire here this is a big old wire and this little blue dot is the uh, geometric center of the wire and I put two X's here and this would be the outside in red and as current builds up is what you can see is that the inner X is going to be cut by more flux than the outer X. So if I look at this from the standpoint of a can going down the center of the wire, hollow can, the resistance of that on the inside is going to be higher than the resistance on the outside because more flux is cutting it. So in higher frequencies current tends to flow on the outside of the wire which is called the skin. And this phenomenon is called the skin effect and um, in 750 uh, megahertz cable TV systems the actual cables have a hollow copper pipe in the center. It's a coaxial cable but it's not solid center. It's, it's hollow. 
And the reason is, this copper is expensive, and if a little current's going to flow in it, then why pay for it? Plus, it makes the cable a lot more flexible. So the skin effect complicates our lives a little bit with regard to varying bandwidths, and um, this will largely be mitigated when we get into a more contemporary uh, design. Uh, so uh, what we can see here is that if we have a system with a large bandwidth, and this is our desired station here, and we have other stations adjacent to it, is that we're going to be attenuating the signal, and I've shown them all being equal in amplitude just, just for reference. And then if I narrow the bandwidth, as we can see now, that this station is greatly attenuated, and this one is attenuated a lot better than was over here. So this is kind of a, a pictorial diagram of how bandwidth would affect the selectivity of a radio receiver. Now, if our bandwidth is too narrow, and what I've shown here in blue are the sidebands with complex modulation, which can vary basically from DC, actually, or carrier, up to 5K, and from the carrier, minus 5K, but realistically we don't listen to sounds, say, 20 hertz or so, so that's why I've shown it like this, is that um, a narrow uh, bandwidth will actually cut off some of the higher frequencies. So in music, uh, some of the harmonics of instruments, say, uh, will be eliminated and the music may sound a little bit muddy. So that was TRF, and then in the, um, in the 20s, um, Major Armstrong came up with a better idea, and he called it the super heterodyne. And uh, this is the radio topology which is present today and is being displaced by um, sample systems called software-defined radios. And we're not going to be discussing those today. But uh, the Bose radio I have upstairs, or my wife has rather, is a super head. And um, it's a very, very common ar architecture. And it solves a lot of problems that the TRF can't. Now the strange thing about this, and I know this is kind of a cluttered diagram, is that our antenna here is picking up a lot of different stations. And it's going through a parallel resonance circuit, and this is going to be tuned to the station that we want to listen to. So we have this effect here going on in the front end of the radio. Then, and this would be the modulation envelope that I've sketched here like we saw before, and then it goes into a non-linear mixer. Now, nonlinear, when we talked about distortion, was called distortion, intermodulation distortion, harmonic distortion. Here, we absolutely have to have it. Then, a local oscillator, shown here with a tuned circuit, and this is ganged, absolutely has to be ganged, is feeding into the mixer um, a signal which is the intermediate frequency above the one you want. So we're actually tuning in a station with an oscillator. Kind of seems strange. Now, um, when these here mix, is what we're going to get is cross products. And 455 kilohertz is the standard intermediate frequency of a contemporary AM radio. And then once we do the mixing and get the cross products, all of the stages thereafter are tuned to the same frequency. Hence, we don't have to worry about any change of bandwidth with regard to um, Q. Um, <clears throat> then it hits our diode detector here, which basically takes this, and this is what it would look like after detection if we did not have a capacitor. Uh, basically cut the bottom half off the envelope. It's more complicated than that. And then after filtering, we get out our, our signal here, and that's called a baseband signal. So the audio itself is called baseband, and when it's modulated up, it is not. Video signal out of a camera is called baseband, and when that's modulated on a carrier from a TV station, it's not baseband any longer. So, um, what this does is it uh, basically translates the carrier down into what's called the intermediate frequency, which is between, so they call it intermediate, it's between the audio and the received frequency coming in from the antenna. Now, I've also included a little circuit down here, and I put the word big next to R and C, and that's standing for a large time constant. 
So what you can see out of this is that it is a unipolar signal and it has a DC component. And the stronger the signal, the higher the DC component. So if we filter this out, is what we get is the DC component, and then we can feed that back into our gain blocks and control the gain. So say we're listening to a um, football game on a radio, and we drive behind a large building with a lot of steel in it, the signal fades. Well, this here voltage would then drop, the ampli amplification of our gain block would increase, and the volume would remain closer to what it was before than if we did not have this. So this is automatic gain control, automatic volume control, uh, or if we went under a bridge or something like that. So when you're thinking about this, just think about cruise control. It's the same thing. Negative feedback tries to keep the gain the same, just like in cruise control, negative feedback tries to keep the speed the same. Very important to note this is nonlinear, and that's why it's got an X in it. It's a multiply symbol. And uh, let's see here. <clears throat> yeah, these have to track. Oh, let's see that come I've expanded this out, and let's see how a station selection actually works. So, um, this here tune circuit is tuned to the station that we desire. And in this case, that's going to be 1100, 1.1 megahertz, 1100 kilohertz. And what I'm showing at the antenna here is four carriers, all of the same amplitude. One is um, 850, 1100 is the one we want, 1220, and then one I'm way out here at 2410. So we'll have to be talking about him. Then uh, this here is amplified. This may be present or not. It's called a radio frequency stage. It, it helps with the signal to noise a little bit. And then we have our local oscillator fixing, uh, feeding into our mixer. And then the output is going to be the intermediate frequency. And then when we tune the station in, uh, we have to tune both of these. And the frequency of the local oscillator is going to be 455 kilohertz plus the station that we're, uh, that we're tuned to. So the oscillator has to track the station we're tuned to and be 455 kilohertz above it. And what we're working into here is the cross products because the cross products, basically the difference between the two frequencies, is going to be the intermediate frequency which is 455 kilohertz. Now to take a look at a radio, we can kind of see the difference in the size of the tuning capacitors. Now this is the local oscillator guy here and what happens is this meshes. This is called a stator and this is called a rotor and this meshes and when it does that the capacity increases which means that the station we're selecting is going to be lower in the AM band. Now since this is a smaller capacitor the frequency associated with this is going to be higher. So just by looking at this, I know that this is the local oscillator capacitor. And you see they're gained because they're on the same shaft. And then this little string here feeds the dial on this particular radio. So it's very important that these, uh, these work together. And um, the stator is grounded, I'm sorry, the rotor is grounded and the stator is not. Now to help with the tracking, we have these two screws on the side here. And these are called patters or trimmers. And what they do is that when this radio is manufactured or went in for service, uh, they would make sure that the uh, 455 difference between the local oscillator and the tuned incoming frequency is the same. So we have some variability there in the absolute value of parts. There's nothing as a zero to um, tolerance part. Further, if we take a look at these IF coils here, these are transformers. Uh, tuned circuits, resonant circuits, and I put a little arrow on the capacitors here, and it doesn't have to be the capacitor, and that means that these are adjustable, but they don't adjust with frequency, and that's the claim to fame of superheterodyne, is these are fixed tuned circuits, so the Q does not vary with them. But um, we have to set this up so that this is resonant at 455, and that little hole in the IF can, okay, so there's a transformer inside this guy is the way you would do that and then on the bottom for the second one there's another hole you have to go in from the bottom of the chassis. You never use a metallic 
you find an uh, object like a screwdriver or whatever to do that, it's got to be a piece of plastic or something, or it'll detune the, um, the circuit here and basically it'll probably cause more damage than you started with as far as the uh, selectivity is concerned. So um, that's kind of where we stand with that. Now let's take a look at um, what happens. We've got four signals coming in. We mix them, and what's coming out of the mixer here is our 815, and we see that it's lower in level. The reason? Distune circuit. And we see that the 1220 is lower in level, and also our 2012, 2410 rather, is lower in level. So we've done quite a bit to suppress the other guys, and the one I'm very concerned about now is this 2410. So this goes through the IF stage, and um, that's going to be 455 kilohertz. And like I said, these do not change with the station. Only this and this tune in the station. So now, um, and this is also, while I'm here, called high side injection, because the local oscillator is 455 kilohertz in this case, above the desired frequency in FM a typical intermediate frequency is 10.7 megahertz. So let's take a look at the cross products. So we have our 1555, our local oscillator here, mixing with, or beating with is another term that's used, our 850, and it produces uh, first level cross, talk, um, cross products of 2405 and 705 kilohertz. They're very far outside the band of this, so we don't have to worry about that. Next, we'll take a look at 1100, and it's mixing with 1555, and that produces 2655. That's going to be the sum, and the difference is 455. So that's a good thing. That's the station we want to listen to. Likewise, with 1220, mixing with 1535 gives us 2775 and 335. So that's uh, it's not going to be much of a problem to remove him as an interferer. And then if we take 1555 and um, I'll mix it with 2010, the sum is going to be 3565, but the difference is 455. Now, that's bad. Um, <clears throat> once a 2410 signal gets to this point, it's free on board with a ton of gain to get through. The radio cannot determine after this that it's an image and it can interfere and does interfere with uh, the station of interest. Now, <clears throat> the police used to be out on 2410. I don't know what they're using the spectrum for now, but the image interference is uh, quite a concern. <clears throat> and uh, it's up to the first tuned circuit to do the best it can to suppress the image. So, in summary here, if we have the frequency of the intermediate frequency um, frequency of the IF intermediate frequency is going to be the frequency of the local oscillator minus F tuned and um, what we can say is that the frequency of the local oscillator is going to be the tuned station plus the frequency of the IF or we could say that F image is the frequency of the local oscillator plus the IF <coughs> or the frequency tuned plus two times the IF. So when we look at what we have here, uh, as you see, all we need is two, the local oscillator and any other, or the image and the tune, and we can basically figure out all four of what we uh, of what we'd be interested in. One being the local oscillator, the tuned, the intermediate frequency, and the last, of course, being the image. Okay, before I get into this, let's just take a look at the filtering. And uh, the filtering involves dealing with cross products. Now there's nothing linear about a diode. And uh, what we're going to see here is that if I free feed three sinusoids into this according to the AM equation that was we had discussed last time, is I should see a full-blown AM envelope. So this is what we're talking about. The purpose of this capacitor, which is relatively small, is it filters out the intermediate frequency component. And then what we're left with after we do that is the baseband audio signal, um, the intelligence signal. Now let me, uh, in my high-tech studio here, zoom in on this for a minute. <coughs> there we 
go. This is pretty good. So what we see here is we have frequency lower sideband is 1.8 volts peak and it's at 454 kilohertz which means that it's a 1 kilohertz modulating frequency because here's my 455. 0 degrees, 90 degrees and this comes out of the equation for the AM modulation signal and then finally I have the upper sideband same voltage as the lower sideband at 456 and negative 90 degrees. Now we use negative and positive cosine to represent that. That feeds into a diode detector and we're just going to be looking at the output across a resistor <coughs> R1. So for this, so what we know is the modulating voltage is equal to the upper sideband voltage plus the lower sideband voltage and adding these together gives us 3.6 volts. Further, the modulation index equals the modulating voltage divided by the carrier voltage 3.6 over 4 volts is 0 0.9 and then if we express that as a percentage we would see 90 percent. So what we would be seeing if we take a look at this point V underscore AM would be this signal here. Now the variations that we see here hold this up a little bit better have to do with uh, the simulation software's printout but you can clearly see that the combining of these signals uh, and it's a linear combination at this point does in fact create an AM envelope. Next, let's take a look at the detected output. Hold them up here. Now we're going to pretend that that capacitor is not present. So what we're seeing is the IF artifacts in here and notice that the bottom half of the waveform has been cut off. So writing on the top of the envelope is we see our sine wave and these little figures in here have to do with the printer and the way uh, the simulation software generated the pulses with regard to the time, sampling time and so forth. But um, it's not part of the signal, the, um, the dark blue. So uh, we have done that and now if we take a look at a case where we're running a high percentage of modulation like a hundred percent is uh, we'll be seeing a little bit of uh, nonlinearity here and that's indicated by this point here where we're getting a little clip. Now what that's going to do is produce even order and odd order harmonic distortion. In square waves and triangle waves there's only odd order but in this case since it's asymmetrical there's going to be even order components in there also. Now with regard to the filter capacitor in the detector circuit if we make that time constant too large what we get is an effect which is kind of strange is called diagonal clipping. Um, type of distortion and uh, you know it's it has to do with making the correct selection of the resistor that's connected to the cathode or the diode and that's the volume control and the filter capacitor that's uh, connected across it. Okay, let me take this up. Now, we have these three sinusoids and what I'd like you to think about is that if we're dealing with cross products here, notice that the sum and difference here is going to be one kilohertz. So even though it's convenient for me to say that the diode waxed the bottom off of the envelope, it's really cross products that are sitting under the hood allowing our signal to be detected. Now we had the IF transformers before uh, pull it up. in our IF stream and um, these are coupled by magnetic flux and I'm showing you here kind of a little core, it's not an iron core but it's uh, many times for 455 it's a ferrite core and I'm trying to show in blue here the flux that's emanating from the primary coil as primary current from the gain block flows into it and this produces a voltage between the secondary and ground. Both of these are tuned circuits tuned to 455. This is a singly tuned circuit so there's only one uh, one tuned circuit in the singly tuned. 
and this would be its waveform. V out is going to be maximum here when the impedance of the parallel resonance circuit is the highest, and Z is going to be the highest. And that is true for Qs greater than 10, and we're certainly talking about that here. So flux linkage has a lot to do with things, and K is the coefficient of coupling. And basically that's how much of the primary flux cuts the secondary, and the voltage that appears in the secondary of this uh, relates to the primary current, and of course this is AC current, um, <clears throat> at the intermediate frequency or the sidebands associated with the, uh, with the signal. Now we can move these closer together or far, uh, further apart, and that's called coupling, and what we see is if they're far apart, we get a selectivity curve or a resonant curve that looks like red. And as we increase the coupling, say move these two coils closer together and they're wound on a vertical bobbin, is we see that we have a lot better uh, gain, if you will, output from the secondary. And then if we really put them close together, we get this dip little guy there and that's called overcoupling. And uh, do note here that the shape of this is pretty square. So a perfect filter would be a rectangle and that's called a brick wall filter. And they don't they don't exist. But uh, this will come in handy a little bit later in FM. So the last thing we need to talk about is the automatic gain control, sometimes called the automatic volume control. And uh, what I'm going to do is take the voltage that we had on the other diagram and feed it back into a P-channel FET that has a characteristic that looks like this. So this is V-gate the source, and this is the uh, drain current and what we're interested in is the transconductance. Now, the transconductance is how the drain current, which is going to be feeding, say this, is controlled by the gate to source voltage. And uh, what we can kind of see here is that the instantaneous slope of this is going to determine what that gain is. So if it's operating down here, it's going to be in a low gain section. If it's operating up here, it's going to be in a high gain section. So the AGC, AVC voltage feeds back and moves the operating point up and down on this curve that affects its gain. Now, if it's operating at this point, the signal would be mirrored off the point, meaning that if I had a signal here, I have to make it a little, we would mirror off the point, and we would see the signal being larger at this point than it would be down there. So that's called a projection, and um, it's the way we can um, take a look at these without getting into uh, a lot of uh, a lot of math. So that's that's basically uh, the story on um, uh, radio receivers, uh, <coughs> AGC and television systems tries to keep the picture constant, and people that live near the airport and watching off-air TV have a lot of issues with that because they get what's called multipath coming off the plane. So there's two signals arriving, one later and then the other. Sometimes they add, uh, they mix additively, meaning a stronger signal. And sometimes they subtract, meaning a weaker signal. So the AGC's job is to try to keep that signal straight. In off-the-air broadcast, if the air rate is high and the forward air correction bits cannot fix it, it won't give you a snowy picture, it won't give you any picture. So it's kind of important that we have a strong signal strength um, basically in every radio application that we, we have. So uh, that'll basically uh, complete it and uh, for receivers and thanks for watching.